Good morning and welcome to the Nature and Wildlife Discovery Center. I'm Diana, Raptor Center Director, and um, this is Theo, our resident peregrine falcon. We're so excited that you could join us again today. We apologize for our late start. Our Wi-Fi wasn't cooperating, but we are here and we're ready to roll. So a few weeks ago, many of you already met Theo, our resident peregrine falcon, but we thought it'd be fun to get him out again and put him to work. So we'll talk a little bit about um, Theo today, just to remind everyone, Theo is a non-releasable or handicapped bird of prey. And what that means is he's had an injury and that injury has left him with a uh, disability to his body. And in Theo's case, this gorgeous little peregrine falcon was actually found in a field near Canyon City, Colorado and um, brought to our center. Actually, we went out and recovered him, but he came to our center for assistance. And when he arrived, we did what always happens to a bird when it comes to us is they um, get an exam. Of course, it's sort of like, just like if you go to the emergency room, there's a group of people who look you over. They try to get you to calm down if you're all hyper <laughs> and all those good things and treat you with what you need. Maybe you need fluids. Maybe you need some medications. Maybe you need a specialized test. Well, those types of things happen to some degree here and through the courtesy of the veterinarians, Dr. Grimroth and Dr. Moses in Colorado Springs, who donate their services to us. So Theo arrived, we gave him an exam to determine what was happening with him and what best, what way we need to proceed to care for him. And we did discover that Theo had fractured a wing, his ulna bone, and that's the same bone that you and I have in our forearm. We have an ulna as well. We're not that different in some respects. Anyhow, Theo um, did break the bone. We thought he broke it in a couple of pieces, but when we got an x-ray the next day from the veterinarians, um, they actually discovered that he had broken it into five pieces. It did take many weeks for the fracture to heal. The veterinarian at, time, at, at the, our time, Dr. Ottersberg was our vet then. Um, he did do surgery and he did run a steel pin through Theo's wing and to hold all of the pieces of bone together while they mended and it took a very long time and actually at the end of the process we um, Dr. Arsberg even used laser therapy to stimulate the tissue to help it to heal so finally it did all mend and we knew pretty much from day one after Dr. Ottersberg's initial diagnosis that Theo most likely was not going to be able to fly properly again. Being a peregrine, his job of course is hunting other animals, in particular birds, and peregrines are the fastest birds on the planet. These guys, when they're diving on their prey, that's their strategy. They hunt from above, and when they spot their prey below them, either on the ground or in the air, they go into a high-speed dive or stoop, as it's called. And when these guys go into these dives or stoops, some birds of prey can reach amazing speeds, like red-tailed hawks can come in at 80 miles an hour, golden eagle at 120, and peregrines? Well, peregrines, as far as we know, the fastest I'm aware of, is that peregrines have been clocked as speeds as fast as 242 miles an hour in a stoop. So they don't always go that fast, and who knows, they may even have the potential to go faster. So it's a, we knew that Theo wouldn't be able to deal with the speed, mostly, not necessarily speed of the dive, but the speed of controlling the dive with his wings. When peregrines are in these stoops and they pull out of them, they are pulling an amazing amount of gravitational force, or Gs, we call it, for G force. And for us, if we're in a situation in a plane or um, an aircraft or a spaceship and we're going faster than about nine Gs, we will pass out. Our body can't handle it, we'll pass out from the experience, and we may even suffer internal injuries from it. This guy, when he pulls out of a stoop, he could easily be pulling nine to 20 Gs of force. And with that much damage to a bone in his wing, there's no way that that bone, even though it's healed, is going to have the original stabilization and power that it once did to survive that kind of forces. So Theo couldn't go back to the wild. So obviously we spoiled him rotten and we did receive permission from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the Colorado Parks and Wildlife to um, keep Theo here at the center to help us do education with everyone else. Well, one of the most fascinating things, and I talk about birds of prey all the time, and I tend to just talk about bird of prey characteristics because they're phenomenal. But, you know, birds in general are just amazing creatures. Oh, he, oh he's going to do one little, are you going to cast your pellet? Let's see. <laughs> he may cast his pellet. I 
That's kind of what he looks like he's trying to do. And if, for, if you're not familiar with a pellet, when a bird eats food, especially a bird of prey, when they ingest their food, maybe a rat, maybe a songbird, maybe a snake, depends on the bird of prey, they tend to eat all of it. So they'll swallow bones and fur and teeth, toenails, muscles, organs, you name it. If it's part of the animal and it's small enough to, he can break down small enough to get it down into his stomach, he'll swallow it. But not all of those foods that he swallows, all of that body parts, can actually be broken down by his stomach acids. So things like bones and fur and feathers, teeth, toenails, scales, exoskeleton, <laughs> all of those type of things um, get left in the stomach. And the stomach is a very powerful muscle in a bird of prey. It's a very muscular kind of gizzard, if you will. And all that leftover stuff um, gets compacted. The stomach compacts it into a tight little ball because as it's pushing things out into the intestines, it's still contracting and it break, it packs it tight. And when that ball is formed, we call it a pellet. And once that pellet's formed, the bird needs to get rid of it. So he regurgitates it. Now all birds of prey regurgitate pellets. Um, and actually a lot of other birds do as well. Um, we see that ravens and crows that we care for here as well, they cast pellets. Other birds, songbirds sometimes eating a lot of insects will cast pellets. So it's not just a bird of prey thing. A lot of birds will create a pellet. Um, they're not always as fun as a bird of prey pellet full of little tiny bones and things, but it is still um, something that birds do to help them get rid of materials that are too um, large for them to pass through their digestive tract. So getting back to birds, I guess it was just a false alarm on his cast, but we'll see. Anyhow, um, <clears throat> birds in general are just fascinating. There's so many different types of birds worldwide, and birds have amazing characteristics that not everyone is really familiar with, but I think we're all familiar with one in particular, and that are feathers. I'm just going to turn Theo, let me see if he'll let me turn him around, and so you can see his whole beautiful, let me get his tail, so you can see all of his beautiful parts. He's just a handsome boy. Um, feathers are, of course, something unique to birds, and actually they're finding some evidence now that there were dinosaurs with feathers, so they're sort of the precursors to modern birds, so it's kind of exciting that they're finding more and more evidence that dinosaurs had feathers. I like that idea a lot. Um, actually, I like the whole idea that I'm working with a, you know, a modern-day dinosaur on my hand, <laughs> so it's kind of fun. But feathers are an amazing creation. They do so much for a bird. Um, and there's lots of different types of feathers. So when you look at the bird, um, you see the feathers on the outside of the body. And the feathers that are on his body, I won't, <laughs> he'll probably nip me, but he has these small feathers that sort of create his shape. They outline his body and they give him a lot of protection. They protect him from the elements because of the design of feathers. Um, different birds have different design to their feathers. There's so much, so many differences between t types of birds, but because of the way that feathers are put together, how they're shaped, how they're designed, it's kind of like a Velcro system in there. Um, feathers are actually water resistant. So if you were to spray water on most birds, you would just see that water sort of beat up and roll off of the feathers to help keep them dry. Um, also, feathers insulate. The outer feathers help to keep him dry. And then during, under those outer feathers, these coverts or coverlet feathers, there is actually another layer of softer feathers, um, especially in the winter months, they get in a, a heavy coat of down and that helps to insulate them from the cold. But in the summertime, they lose that down, but still the layers of feathers on their body actually help to also insulate them from the heat. Now, a lot of times people think that feathers are just randomly placed on a bird's body. Well, actually they're not. They're in very um, strict pat, um, tracks or patterns. So if we were to, um, Theo won't let me, but if I were to be able to start separating his feathers, you would see that actually his feathers just go <laughs> in rows down his body. And then the webbing, on either side. So Theo, your wings set off my feather that I had for example. But you know on a feather there's a shaft. Let me see. I'm just take a quick dive and get my feather that Theo's wings. Hold on. Be right back. <laughs> oh, stop. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> You never know on live TV. <laughs> so I have a great horned owl feather. So if we look at the back of it, you know, there's a central shaft that travels down the middle of the feather. 
and that when the feather is growing, um, that shaft provides the bird um, the feather with nutrients. It's actually when it's growing, the shaft is filled with blood to nourish the webbing. And that, of course, is this beautiful spot here. And then the feathers are kind of held. Let me see if Theo would step up off my hand for just a second. Can you behave yourself, young man? We'll see. Some days are better than others with Theo. He's a very curious little fellow. But anyway, so you've got this lovely um, webbing. And then the web, if you look really close, if you ever have a chicken feather or some other feather, um, you can pull it apart and then you can take your fingers and you can zip it right back together. And that's what a bird does. Um, when they're cleaning their feathers and they get a little separated or roughed up, they actually run their beak along the feather and actually zip it all back together. And that zipping action, which is little structures in there that actually help to hold it together, that's actually what helps the feather to be water resistant and, um, and keep the bird dry when it's out in the rain. Now, not all birds are as weatherproof as others. Um, waterfowl obviously are very watertight. They have amazing feathers on their bellies um, that kind of wrap around the underside of their belly so that when they're floating on the water, um, they're, they're dry. It's pretty amazing how well those feathers keep them dry. But owls, on the other hand, aren't as watertight because the structure of their feathers are built to be incredibly soft and um, move silently across each other so they can fly silently they actually get wet quicker and so it's always interesting that usually you know you see hawks roosting out even in a storm they're sitting out it's not a big deal to them to get wet but if it's raining you rarely see an owl <laughs> they are undercover because they can't uh, aren't as water resistant so feathers are really kind of cool for that also um, feathers can provide camouflage to the bird theo is dark on the top and light on the bottom and that's a camouflage when he's above something, the sun is shining, he's got a paler belly so that it might um, help to camouflage him as he's coming in. He has a darker side on his back, which may camouflage him when he's sitting up on a cliff or in a tree, um, especially if he's protecting his young. Um, peregrines make a scrape in a cliff and they lay on their eggs up on that scrape, which is just a depression in the soil. And so being darker might actually help to camouflage you from a predator soaring above because yes, birds of prey do prey on other species of, <laughs> on each other. So he would have to be worried with that. Um, great horned owls, we've met Guffy and we met Jasper. They're definitely camoed to help them um, hide in lots of different environments. Um, also, some birds have fancy feathers on the top of their heads, like great horned owls. They have those two feathers on the top that look like a pair of horns. Those are also believed to be camouflage to help break up the owl's silhouette. Um, maybe also feathers can be used for communication. They can flash certain parts of their body. Uh, maybe they have a white throat that if they're a nighttime hunter and they want to communicate, perhaps if they breathe in and out very quickly with that um, throat and make it flutter. We call that guller fluttering. It could be a signal for other birds of prey, um, other members of their family that they're sitting there. So there's a lot we don't know yet about communication, but we learn all the time. We're always learning something new about birds. And then of course also feathers are colored and there's a lot of things that create fe color in feathers. Um, some of it can be pigments. Some of it can be the structure of the feather of itself only um, reflects or refracts certain types of light to give it its color. So there's a lot of things going on with the color. And a lot of times color, especially in very colorful birds, um, is there to attract a mate, to make you look good to the opposite sex. So all those brightly colored males in the springtime, they are out there showing off. So feathers can do a lot. And in most birds, feathers also help to generate flight. So it's an amazing tool that these guys have. And because feathers do so much for the bird, it's a very important um, thing, uh, project for them every day is to take care of those feathers. They spend a good part of their day, 10 to 20% of their day perhaps, is just spent cleaning themselves. They groom the feathers, usually with their beak. And um, Theo's a little upset right now. It's pretty hot out today. Even though we're in the shade, we're feeling the 90 plus temperature. Um, so he's panting a little bit just to cool himself off. Anyhow, 
um, they have to groom those feathers daily. And grooming is important, just like for our hair. You know, you want to brush your hair to get any snarls out, to get any debris out of your hair, to distribute oil from your scalp down um, into your hair to help it be moist. Because just like our hair, once it's out of the follicle, it's dead. And the same thing for the feather. Once the feather has grown out and is unfurled, because it kind of grows out in a cylinder, um, as it's growing, it's covered with a little pla a little um, sheath of, of tissue, and as the feather grows longer and longer, um, the bird will start to pull that sheath off and unfurl the webbing and groom it and get it into place. But once it is fully grown out and unfurled, um, the body takes the blood back from the shaft, and from that point on, the feather is dead. So the bird has to keep it moisturized and rejuvenated, and it does that in lots of ways. One, by grooming, helping to pass oils down from the skin to throughout the feather, and in some birds, like Theo, on the back near the base of their tail, right about here. Oh, that was my fault. I touched him. His shame on me. Anyhow, <laughs> they have a little gland called a uropygial gland that actually secretes an oil. So they'll reach around with their beak and they'll pinch that gland and get a little oil on their beak and tongue and then they'll use it to distribute that oil to their feathers and that helps them to keep their feathers in great condition and add to the waterproofing. So there's a lot going on that he has to take care of. Um, because birds have to take care of their feathers with their beak, birds have um, really evolved a very long neck <laughs> to help them be able to turn their heads and reach almost every part of their body. In fact, all the feathers on Theo's body, except for his head, are groomed by his beak. So he's one flexible guy. I mean, he gets down to these tail feathers by moving his neck to the side and grabbing the tail at the base and running the feather. It's just a phenomenal thing to watch a bird preen or groom itself, um, what they do with that beak. So what do you do with your head? Your beak doesn't reach up there. Well, you can groom the feathers on your head with your claws or your talons, and that's what a lot of birds do. Some birds, um, in so for social behavior, actually groom each other's heads. So a, a mated pair, they might spend some time grooming each other's heads. And some birds, this is so cool, um, on their middle claw, they actually have um, in raptors, or in actually in hawks and falcons, <laughs> and, and most of the owls, um, their middle toe actually has um, kind of a sharp edge on it, and that edge helps them to tear and pull against. But in some birds, um, not birds of prey, except for barn owls, but I know, um, let's see, members of the uh, poor wolf family, like night hawks and common poor, common um, poor wills, those type of guys, they actually, on their middle claw, they have um, sort of a comb-like structure on that claw, and they actually use that to help them groom the feathers on their head, especially barn owls use it to do their facial discs. And that's a really cool tool that they have to take care of their feathers. And then finally, of course, birds are there, feathers are there for flying. So you want to take good care of your feathers, and feathers are critical for survival if you're a bird. In they do molt, birds do molt or replace their feathers as they wear out. They generally do the molting in birds of prey, it's once a year, and that's usually after nesting season and before migration. They sort of want to get into the best shape they can um, going into winter. Also, it takes a lot of energy to go through a molt. Um, they've got to grow a whole lot of new feathers in a very short time. In birds of prey, we see them molting in kind of actually cool patterns. They will molt um, equally on their wings so that their wings stay in balance when they fly. They usually, um, depending on the bird or the species, they'll start to molt, they'll drop one feather, their follicle will drop a feather, and then the new feather will start to grow in. And usually when it's about half grown, the next feather down will drop and that one will start growing in and they'll just kind of keep that going. And it takes them several weeks to get through all the feathers on their wing. And in particular, in birds of prey, they definitely every year will molt their primaries and secondaries on the wing. And those are those big, long feathers. So as you see, there he goes, Theo. He's got his big, long feathers on the end of his wing and um, he needs to molt those annually because they get a lot of wear and tear. So he wants to replace those. They typically also will molt their tail on an annual basis because the tail gets a lot of wear and tear. 
Other places that we usually see them molting, a lot of feathers once a year. Um, the top of the wing, where the air travels over the edge of the wing. Yep, there we go, see it opens up. You can see how the air would go right over the top there. And that would be a lot of wear and tear. So we often see that they all molt those feathers on an annual basis. But other feathers on the body may not be molted annually. Um, they may only molt certain feathers on their body once every two or three years. And if um, you ever come and visit us or um, next time Akeel is out, I'll try to show you a close up of the feathers on her wings, the brown, there's so many shades of brown. And that's just because the feathers are all different ages. The really dark chocolate brown on her, um, on her body feathers are the new ones. <laughs> and the really pale colored ones are two, three, four years old and she hasn't molted them or needed to because they're still in good shape. So feathers are critical to a bird and um, they take good care of them and we try to do the same. We try to make sure that we're giving them good nutrition so their feathers um, can stay healthy and their body is healthy. So all of these things come real important and for us feather breakage is a huge no-no. <laughs> if we break a feather um, for, from an educational program or um, a treatment we feel really bad because we know it's going to be a long time before that feather will get replaced. So we work very hard to protect feathers on the birds. Other things about birds, they all have amazing vision. They have large eyes and depending on um, what they're hunting or searching for food. Some of course birds are plant eaters, some eat animals, <laughs> some hunt fish. So they all have a different diet. Some eat both plants and animals. So it's kind of interesting, but their eyes are better than ours. They, some of them are really great at seeing color. Day hunters in the birds of prey see very well, cool colors. Um, night hunters just see mostly in black and white because that's a, a more important tool to have in low light conditions. And also their eyes can focus on different things at the same time. You and I have one point of focus. When we look at something, both eyes go and they focus on it. So everything around where I'm looking right at the camera, all of the stuff around me, I mean, I notice it moving but it's not in focus. It's just sort of a motion to the side. So I have one point of focus, but Theo, <laughs> this is amazing. He has four points of focus. He has one eye going this way. He has another point going this way oh, outside. He's got on the other side, same thing. One goes this way, one goes this way. He has, he can notice four things in detail moving around him. Plus he can track much faster than we can. The best way, let me think how, okay, when you watch a movie, uh, movies are actually just a series of still images moving really fast. So our eye is tricked into think we're seeing move, movement. And when we um, watch a movie, it, it's running at about 30 pictures per second when we see it. And it looks nice and smooth to us. Well, when he's tracking something and it's moving, he sees twice as fast as we can. So for him to see a movie clearly, that movie would have to be moving at about, for him, for, well, we wouldn't be able to notice a difference, but for him, he'd be tracking a movie at like 60 um, pictures per second. So he can track very, very well to spot his prey. And most birds have this. Um, think about all the birds that eat insects. I mean, you've got a Phoebe chasing a mosquito. That's a tiny little object, but he has to track it very, very high rate of speed so that he can catch it. So their ability to track with their eyes is, is much more impressive than ours. So that's a really cool adaptation or tool that um, birds have. Also, birds have beaks. We've talked a little bit about beaks definitely for grooming your feathers. Actually, some birds have specialized beaks just for taking care of their feathers in addition to eating. And a bird's beak um, kind of dictates or what he eats dictates the shape of the beak. I'm not sure which way. It's kind of like which came first, the chicken or the egg. But if you're ripping and tearing, a hook shape comes in great. If you're spearing fish like a heron, um, <laughs> it's very nice to have that long spear shaped beak. Or if you're a grazing um, bird like some of the ducks and geese are, you have a little flatter beak with serrations on the inside so that you can cut off the plants. So birds all have different adaptations to their beaks designed to help them eat a specific type of food. So beaks are really cool. Basically the beak is just the nose and the mouth engineered together um, to help the bird eat. And that helps with efficiency. Also efficiency is very important to these guys. Um, they are very lightweight creatures. Theo weighs about a pound and a half. That's all that he weighs. And to help him weigh that little one, he's covered in feathers. Feathers are incredibly lightweight. 
That's another cool tool about them. Also, um, his whole body mass is pretty much concentrated in his little body here. All the big muscles, the muscles controlling the wing, the muscles controlling his legs, everything, all the big muscles are kind of centered towards the body. Um, when you get out into the wings and his legs, most of the um, tissues out there are just tendons and ligaments helping to pull things, and but that's just to keep him light and in balance. Also, his bones are hollow. So when he is flying, the bigger bones are hollow, so they reduce the body weight tremendously. If we took all Theo's bones um, and weighed them, when they were dry, they would probably just weigh a few ounces. So there's not a lot to being a bird. They're just amazing, amazing creatures. They also breathe more efficiently than we can. Um, I know Theo's panting because he's hot. That's how he cools himself. But if you watch Theo breathe, um, it's kind of an interesting thing if you ever to be able to see them breathing internally. Um, you and I, we breathe in, we breathe out. <laughs> Our lungs, we have a diaphragm to help push the air in and out. It's in and out. Birds don't have diaphragms, so their air actually moves a little bit different. Theo takes a breath in, and actually the air goes into one side, into one lung. He takes another breath. The new air pushes um, the, the first breath further down into some things called air sacs. They have these um, literally sacs filled with air throughout their body cavity. They actually have six in their body cavity and some of them actually they also have them in their bones and that helps them to distribute oxygen. So basically what's happening is Theo breathes in, the air goes in here, the air sacs are filled, some air is actually passed into the bone of his wing and then he takes another breath and that air, the air pushes again through past the legs back up into the other lung, into the other side of the air sacs, and then eventually it gets pushed out. So he breathes in a circular motion through his body. That means he's utilizing a lot more oxygen than we do when we breathe in and out. Also moving that air through his body cools him. It actually helps him to keep cool. So when he's in flight, he's actually incredibly efficient because he's pumping, those chest muscles are pushing, and actually helping him to push air through his body and cool himself off. So these guys have a lot of things going on to make them so incredible and special. And we didn't even get to feet. Of course, in Birds of Prey, those feet are huge and powerful, and they are for um, grasping prey, but in other birds, maybe they have these super long toes and pads um, or webbing between their toes so they can walk on lily pads, if you will, in the swamp. Or if they're a swimming bird, they have those webbed feet for actually paddling and swimming. So there's just a lot of things going on with birds. And they are so critical and important to our environment. We don't think about birds much sometimes. We see them everywhere. They live on every continent, including Antarctica. Um, hopefully you've seen those, some of the cool documentaries on, um, on the um, penguins. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I got to visit um, a research station in Australia that studies the little penguins or fairy penguins. Um, and that was my first experience in the wild seeing penguins and they were just the coolest birds. <laughs> I was so happy I got to see them. I haven't made it to Antarctica yet, but you know, I still got time. So I'm hoping I'd love to go and see those big emperor penguins walking around. Oh, it'd be so awesome. Um, but they do enhance our lives. I mean, oh my gosh, it's fun to watch birds. It's definitely something that we want to attract into our gardens and our fields because so many birds eat insects. And if we think about it, they're an indicator species. Because some of them are so small and some of these guys are so specialized feeders, when something goes wrong with the planet, when something's not quite right where they are, it usually hits them. One of, they're one of the first animals to be struck um, with some kind of um, disease or catastrophe. And they're really giving us a big warning. Um, as our climate is changing, whether it's man-made or normal, that's up to you to decide. Um, but it is changing and birds are making changes too. So a lot of scientists are watching bird patterns and how they're responding to the changes that we see. So these guys are really quite magnificent. They're fun to watch. I know last night I was leaving the center and um, about four osprey were soaring over the river and I just had to stop and watch. They were just so beautiful and I was so jealous <laughs> that they get to fly like that. Oh, wouldn't it be great if we could sprout wings and go? Um, but it's just an amazing thing to be able to watch them and share their lives. I've had a great career um, so far with birds 
and I never tire of them and I'm always excited to learn new things about them. And we do have some opportunities this summer for kids. We got the go ahead to do summer camps, yay! <laughs> Governor um, Polis announced um, last week that it's okay for day camps to go into operations. So we are so excited. We'll be offering our camps this summer. Um, we do have to make a few modifications to some of them, but um, most of them are gonna be going. We have all kinds of safety things in um, place to make it happy and healthy for the kiddos to get outside and enjoy the summer. And Theo's ready to go to camp, he's ready. So if you want to learn more about our summer camps, you can visit us on our website at hikeandlearn.org. And I think um, yesterday or the day before, if you kind of scroll back through Facebook on our page, um, you might notice also, uh, I think Ashley, our program director, posted the information as well about our summer camp. So there's lots of places to learn about us. So for Theo and I, we wanna thank you for tuning in today. Um, and oh, see, there he goes. He's going to um, gr groom his toes. <laughs> there we go. See, beaks are just amazing tools. But Theo and I um, hope that we find you well today and that you're still staying safe. Um, remember, we still need to kind of social distance a bit. Um, things are relaxing just a little bit, but do wear your face mask to protect others and ultimately protecting yourself. Um, we all wear face masks here at the Raptor Center. We had a volunteer look. They made a little, it's, I don't know if you can see it, it's owls. So they made us little owl face masks. So a wonderful volunteer did that for us. So we are certainly practicing. We're hoping in the next few weeks, again, that we'll be open. Um, we're working on guidelines um, to make it safe for everyone to visit our center. And we can't wait for that to happen. We've missed you. And I know the birds are missing people as well. So you guys get out there. Enjoy it. Stay cool today. If you're in Southern Colorado, it's a toasty one. But hopefully we'll see you um, tomorrow for another edition of our weekend Raptor Talk. Thanks. Have a good day.